My name is Greg Snyder from the University of Notre Dame, and I'd like to tell you today why I think it's time for adiabatic computing. So a question, how fast do you run a circuit? Well, the answer, of course, is always as fast as you can. But really, how fast is that? And the answer is that it, of course, depends, because there are always constraints. Uh, First is the inherent speed. You know, there's an RC time constant associated with the circuit, and that's going to set the maximum speed at which you can run the circuit. However, there's also often a thermal budget. If you run the circuit too fast, you might exceed the amount of cooling that you can provide to the circuit. And there might also be an energy budget that you're allowed to use while running the circuit. And so the effects of this can be seen in this chart that we've all seen of Intel microprocessors over time once they went to full CMOS in the 386. Uh, the power per unit area went up exponentially through the late 80s and the 90s as the circuits were run as fast as they could be by the internal uh, time constants of the circuit. However, about 2000, they realized that they were getting close to the limits of air cooling, and so they needed to bend this curve over, and so they did that by using techniques such as multi-core or dark silicon. So now you can see the effects of running the circuit not as fast as it can by internal delays, but by external thermal constraints. So what is the power dissipation in conventional uh, irreversible logic? Well, of course, we're all familiar with this equation where the power is given by the number of devices times alpha, the activity factor CV squared F plus power dissipation. Now, I'd like you to think of this uh, CV squared as two times the bit energy because in CMOS, information is encoded on the energy stored on the capacitor, which is one half CV squared. And so this is two times the bit energy. So how do you reduce the power dissipation? Well, first you can reduce the voltage, uh, which the industry has been doing for decades. You can try to reduce the capacitance, but that doesn't work too well if you're scaling in multiple dimensions. You can reduce or at least hold constant F. This is what's done in multi-core or you can turn off parts of the circuit which is going after the activity factor alpha. You can also go after the passive power because there's a link in conventional CMOS between passive power and active power. And that's because as you lower this voltage, you also have to lower the threshold of the transistors. And as you lower the threshold, you get more leakage giving pow passive power dissipation. Adiabatic circuitry can break this link between the passive and the active power. So how low can you go? Well, if you go to a bit energy of about 100 kT, about the lowest for mistake-free computation, that's about 400 zeptajoules at room temperature. If you run at a frequency of 100 gigahertz, which is about what we could do today, uh, number of devices of 10 to the 11th per square centimeter, do the math, you come up with eight kilowatts per square centimeter, which is more than the surface of the sun. But this is an extreme example, of course, because you can't run the thing at full frequency every device, but it does give an order of magnitude of the uh, problem that we're facing today. And so the question is, is there a minimum energy required for computation? And this goes all the way back to Maxwell's demon in the 19th century, where Maxwell postulated a thought experiment where if there was a demon that could make measurements of a system and perform a reversible operation, such as opening and closing a frictionless gate, he could do things like sorting gas molecules, lowering the entropy of the system without doing net work, which is prohibited by the second law of thermodynamics. So what's really going on? And people have been arguing about that ever since. Zillard in 1929 postulated that measurement causes a dissipation to heat of at least KT log two. This was a special case in his paper, but this KT log two is a magic number that shows up in a lot of different places. Perhaps the best description is Shannon's ultimate limit where Claude Shannon showed that you had to invest at least KT log two of energy to encode a bit of information that was distinguishable from noise. 
And so Zillard appeals to our high school quantum mechanics where we learn that if you measure a system, you disturb the system and that disturbance must be uh, on the order of KT log two. Landauer postulated that it was not uh, measurement, but destruction of information that causes a dissipation, again, of at least KT log two per bit. This has come to be known as Landauer's principle. And so in, in this case, if you don't destroy the bit, you don't dissipate energy, which appeals to our conservation of energy. Create a bit, invest energy, destroy a bit, throw away the energy to heat. Bennett in 1982 showed that you can do full computation without erasure, without destruction of information. And so in principle, you can do a dissipationless computation, but that requires that you do everything completely reversibly, which means it takes the life of the universe to get your answer. So you need some sort of a link between logical reversibility and physical reversibility, and this is still somewhat controversial. Uh, following Landauer, the idea is to avoid erasure or destruction of information, and the reason to do an adiabatic charging and discharging is shown here, where if you look at sort of the normal transistor as a resistor model of an abrupt transition as in CMOS, you would dissipate as much energy in the resistor as you deliver to the capacitor, one half CV squared. However, if you do an adiabatic ramp up and ramp down, you can deliver the full energy to the capacitor and dissipate less, perhaps much less energy in the resistor or transistor. Well, people argued about the Landauer principle for decades, uh, but nobody did any experiments because everybody thought that KT log two, three zeptojoules at room temperature was immeasurable. It wasn't until a few years ago that folks like this group in France began to do measurements of irreversible operations where they become more and more adiabatic and approach this limit, Shannon's limit of KT log two. Uh, the group at Notre Dame decided to investigate the other side of the Landauer principle. You know, can you dissipate less than KT log two if you don't destroy the information? And so here was the experiment that we did. We have a memory cell that's made up of a real capacitor and a real resistor, and then essentially a switch where we can select the operation, either store a logic one, ramp up to a positive voltage, store a logic zero, ramp down to a negative voltage, store no information, hold it at zero volts, or put it into a hold state. And so we store some information in there by selecting one of these, say ramp up to one, put it to the hold state, and now we have a decision to make when we want to erase the bit. If we have a copy of the bit someplace else, we're not destroying the information because we have a copy, then we can use that information to make a choice to put the switch to the proper position and ramp down, for instance, the uh, voltage, recover the energy from the capacitor without dissipating it in the resistor. If we're going to destroy the bit of information, we have no way to know where to put the switch so we can either guess or just slam it to the ground position and dissipate the energy of the bit in the resistor. So here's our experiment where we operated on 73 KT bits of information. Here's the input. Uh, the red trace is the voltage across the capacitor with just a single trace. So we're showing that we're delivering a good strong bit of information. The voltage across the resistor to measure the dissipation is shown in blue in a single trace. There's essentially nothing there, but if you do a bunch of averaging, you can pull out the signal at about two and a half nanovolts. And if you do the integral, you find that the dissipation to heat is only 0.005 KT or about 15 yocta joules. So well below uh, KT log two in accordance with the Landauer principle. Well, uh, energy recovery and computation can be done with reversible logic because you can recover and then what do you do with the bit energies after you recover them? Well, you. Uh, for instance, have a signal generator that puts bits into the chip and takes them back. 
with adiabatic reversible logic, you can dissipate less than 200 watts per square centimeter. But if you don't recycle the bits in the signal generator, you may still need a nuclear power plant because you're going to burn those bits to heat in the signal generator. A much better approach is to use something like a resonant clock generator that can recover and recycle and reuse the energy used for the bits. And so in this case, you could power the clock generator with a person on a bicycle that can generate about 200 watts. Uh, MEMS resonators, for instance, can do this at higher Q, better efficiency than conventional circuits. Well, when does it make sense to do this energy recovery and recycling? Well, of course, the goal in any computation is to minimize the use of your resources, time, space, and energy. So computer engineers like a figure of merit EDA. Uh, this is the product of energy, delay, and area. If you have some technology, it's going to have an intrinsic best performance metric, E0 minimum energy, D0 minimum delay, and A0 uh, minimum area. Now in the three-dimensional space, these planes of constant figure of merit are shown in blue, so you would have a lower one here shown in dark blue, one not quite as good in light blue, but there are other things such as a constraint due to a dissipation per unit area shown in light red for a higher dissipation and darker red for a lower dissipation. Uh, Craig Lent has built a MATLAB tool where you can visualize this nicely, but three-dimensional plots are kind of painful, so you can, uh, you can collapse two of the axes onto one axis. And let's look at a now two-dimensional plot for an example of E0 at one attajoule, D0 at 10 picoseconds, and A0 at 10 to the minus 11 centimeters squared. That puts you right here at E0, D0, A0, but this would dissipate 10 to the fourth watts per square centimeter, which is less than the surface of the sun, but still not really usable. So somehow we need to get down to this curve of uh, 100 watts per square centimeter. And so we're going to have to sacrifice some performance. If we use the approach of multi-core, what we do is essentially uh, increase the delay by some constant C, and that moves us to uh, 100 watts per square centimeter, but we've also degraded our figure of merit by a factor of 100. If we do dark silicon, essentially we spread the dissipation over a larger area with uh, this factor C. Same thing, we get to the dissipation we need, but we degrade our figure of merit by a factor of 100. If we do a reversible approach, what we do is we actually reduce the energy used while increasing the delay taken. And so we stay on this same curve of E0, D0, A0, so we're making the best use of our limited resources. If you have a system that's energy constrained, uh, the appropriate figure of merit could be E squared dA, in which case adiabatic approach makes even more sense. So what about the future of computation? Well, I would suggest that no matter what your state variable, spin, charge, whatever, you're gonna have to worry about your bit energies and whether you throw them to heat or try to recycle them. Well, does this imply that you need to go to a fully reversible system to have any gain? And do you need new devices? Well, I would suggest that the, uh, a good approach would be to have reversible blocks. So you operate reversibly within a block, but you've broken up your system so that the overhead associated with reversibility does not grow too large. And so here you can operate reversibly here take the hit where you have to pay for the destruction of information where you pass from one reversible block to the next, but then operate reversibly within the next block. So of course, what are the trade-off? Well, as always with adiabatic reversible systems, there's a speed to energy trade-off. And of course, there's always complexity associated with reversibility. Uh, to implement a real system, we're looking at adiabatic CMOS using split rail charge recovery logic shown here, and Bennett clocking, which is a retractal cascade clocking setup shown here. 
where we apply a clock uh, to the first level of logic, then the second level of logic, then the third level of logic by ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. And then reversibility, energy recovery, is uh, achieved by ramping it down in reverse order to recover the energy, ramp down, ramp down, ramp down. The system that we've chosen to implement is a MIPS microprocessor based on the mini MIPS from Westy and Harris. Uh, here we implement the system using three Bennett zones of 12 phases and for simplicity, there's no pipelining. Uh, this is a plot of the layout that we implemented. Uh, this was supported by an STTR phase one from the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, and we are currently preparing this for fabrication under an STTR phase two. And I mentioned resonant clocks, uh, and here is some work that we're doing to use contour resonators using aluminum nitride. Here's one of our devices. Uh, for new devices, well, we've shown that you can use CMOS for adiabatic reversible logic. Uh, but new devices can have new capabilities. And so one that we're looking at is adiabatic com capacitive logic. This was developed by our French collaborators. Uh, the idea is to use a MEMS relay-like relay device, but use it as a variable capacitor to implement logic instead of fighting against the inherent problems with electrical contacts that you have in nano relays. And so by moving this, uh, plate here, you can change the ratio of these capacitors by a large amount as shown by the console, console simulations. Now being from Notre Dame, I of course like quantum dot cellular automata, where you encode the information in the position of electrons within a group of quantum dots. Now the advantage of QCA is that this maps well down to molecular dimensions and we've shown that we can move individual electrons within molecules. Uh, but most importantly, QCA maps well onto adiabatic reversible architectures. Okay, and in summary, you know, future progress in computation is gonna require recycling the energy. You can't just burn all of your bits to heat. There's no fundamental limit on the energy needed, just practical ones, because you're making a trade of speed for power. This is a trade-off that's already being made with dark silicon and multi-core. I would suggest that adiabatic uh, computing is another way to do it, which may have advantages in some situations. We've implemented a MEMS-based microprocessor, and we are also looking at uh, beyond CMOS devices that can truly reap the benefits of adiabatic processing. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank collaborators at uh, Notre Dame, uh, graduate students, visitors, and faculty, our industry collaborators at Indiana Integrated Circuit, and finally, the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Airport Air Force for uh, financial support. Thank you.